Our subject this evening is Bishop Barclay and David Hume. Both of these are 18th century philosophers. Both are British empiricists. Both are derivatives of the trend developed by John Locke. Both are typical of the final epistemology offered by the period known as the Enlightenment. The 17th century, as you know, is called the Age of Reason, generally. And the 18th, as a result, the Enlightenment. But the philosophers of the Age of Reason, as you also know, put forth deeply platonic and or skeptic notions of what reason consisted of. And the result was that the dominance of reason, of the explicit advocacy of reason, had to come to an end. And the two philosophers of the uh, Enlightenment period with whom it does come to an end are Barclay and Hume. Now, both of these men, I hasten to add, are, in their own view, staunch advocates of reason. But when you see what their systems are, you will see why other contemporary and later philosophers said reason has had its chance and has failed. And the result was the ushering in of an era of avowed mysticism and irrationalism starting in the late 18th century and intensifying without exception to the present day. Let us then start with Barclay, 1685 to 1753. So he was about 19 when Locke died. Now, as a bishop, Barclay, needless to say, is a deeply religious man. One of the main goals of his philosophy was to combat what he regarded as a major obstacle to religion, namely matter. That is to say, the concept of an external, independent, physical reality. This, he believed, was always a thorn in the side of religion. Religion preached that God created matter ex nihilo, out of nothing, and there were always skeptics around, and not simply skeptics, to ask, how can you get something out of nothing? The belief in matter always gave way periodically to people like Hobbes, who said, we can explain everything simply in terms of matter, and thereby deny the soul, deny God, deny immortality. The belief in matter gave rise to mechanism, the idea that the laws of mechanics, the laws of physics, explain everything that happens, and we can dispense, therefore, with God's purpose, with God's plans, with God's miracles. But, thinks Barclay, if we can get rid of the material world, if we can show that there is no external physical world, we will once and for all have cut the base out of the materialists the skeptics and the atheists in the most profound way. And of course, he is correct here. The material world is the philosophic enemy of God, so he knows what to attack. Now, Barclay, as I said, is an empiricist. He agrees with not Locke that all knowledge comes from experience. There are no innate ideas. Uh, we can only acquire knowledge on the basis of experience. But he is much more consistent than Locke was, <coughs> as you'll see. He accepts all of Locke's basic premises and uses them to demonstrate the non-existence of the physical world. He is therefore classified, of course, as an idealist in the technical philosophic sense. We end up with Berkeley with a world of individual minds, presided over, of course, by God, each contemplating its own experiences. And thus, we have a universe very similar to Leibniz's, only now we reach this kind of idealism not via the rationalist root of Leibniz, but via the empiricist root of Berkeley. And because empiricism was much more influential in the Anglo-American world than rationalism ever was, Berkeley is the first really influential modern empiricist. Now, I want to devote our time to Barclay's arguments against the existence of an independent material world. 
You must understand, of course, when we talk about an external material world, we mean anything external to the mind, and therefore that includes your brain, and your body, your arms and legs and liver. All of that goes when the physical world goes. Now let's first of all get clear what Barclay is driving at before we hear his arguments. Consider the example of a toothache and ask yourself the question, can you have a toothache without experiencing it? Can a toothache, not a tooth now, but a toothache, exist or be real if you in no way perceive it, experience it, or are aware of it? Suppose I point at you, for instance, taking someone at random and say to you, I'm sorry that you have such a raging searing, painful toothache this evening. And you say to me, what do you mean? I don't feel any toothache at all. I'm not aware of any such thing. What if I came back with, well, what's the difference whether you're aware of it or not? After all, facts are real whether or not people are aware of them. A is A. Don't facts exist independent of consciousness? You'd say to me, well, look, this is a very special kind of existence you're talking about. A toothache is an experience. It's something that exists only in the mind. It is not an external fact. You would say the very reality or being of a toothache consists in its being perceived. If nobody experiences the toothache, the toothache is unreal. Now, if you were prone to use Latin to express this viewpoint, you would say, in an expression made famous by Bishop Barclay, esse est per cipi. E-S-S-E, that's Latin for to be. E-S-T, which is Latin for is. P-E-R-C-I-P-I, -I, which is Latin for to be perceived. In the case of a toothache, you would say, Esse est per cipi. Its being consists of its being perceived. If it weren't perceived, it would not exist. It would be nothing. Now, Barclay proposes to argue that matter, every kind of matter and every quality of matter, is in the identical metaphysical position as the toothache. Not only color, sound, taste, temperature, but extension, three-dimensionality, solidity, size, shape, motion, everything pertaining to matter is simply a set of experiences, simply a set of ideas in the mind. In the case of matter, he is going to argue esse est per cipi. And there is therefore no independent external material world at all. Now this will be, according to him therefore, the triumphant proof of what objectivism would call the primacy of consciousness. Physical existence is going to become simply a series of subjective mental experiences. And thus Barclay's philosophy is referred to as subjective idealism. Idealism, because it believes that true reality is something more basic than the material world. Subjective, to contrast it on the one hand to Platonism, which believes that true reality is the non-material, unconscious world of forms. And to contrast it on the other hand to the later view of Hegel, which believes that there is one cosmic consciousness, the absolute, which constitutes true reality. Barclay believes that separate individual minds are real. Each individual subject is real. And reality consists of these individual minds and their content. And that viewpoint is known as subjective idealism. How does Barclay defend a viewpoint like this? Well, he gives a great many arguments in his work on the principles of human knowledge and also in a famous series of dialogues uh, between two characters, Hylas and Philonous. Hylas deriving from the Greek word hule for matter. So Hylas is the man who believes in matter. And Philonous, the man who has philo for nous, that is to say the mind lover, the idealist in the technical sense. And of course, Philonous wins all the arguments. Now, I'm going to give you two 
of the major sets of arguments that Barclay gives. There's many more, but these two will be ample for our purposes. One set derives from the causal theory of perception, the causal and representative theories of perception, which I have stressed many times in this course. The second set derives from the primary-secondary quality distinction. Let's look first at the argument from the causal theory of perception. This is the viewpoint, as you recall, accepted by Hobbes, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, that all that we directly perceive as the experience is in our own mind, not reality. And you remember their reason? Uh, our senses obviously process the data we get. And there are we at the end of the chain perceiving only the end effects on us. Therefore, we don't directly perceive reality, only its effects on us. But they all claim reality must exist to be the cause of our experiences, and thus the name, the causal theory of perception. And they went on, although we don't directly perceive reality, we can know something about it, because some, at least, of our experiences represent or copy or resemble reality. Locke had taken that view. Now here is where Barclay takes off and begins to slaughter both the causal and the representative theories of perception, and in the process, annihilate the material world. Well, let's start with the representative theory of perception. Barclay begins, at least in the order that I'm giving you his arguments, by asking Locke, how can a sensation or an idea, or an experience, which is what you say we directly perceive. How can any one of those things resemble, or copy, or be like something that is not a sensation, an idea, or an experience? Consider the sensation or experience, for instance, of a shape, like a triangle. Now, says Locke, that sensation of a shape is just like the real shape out there in reality. Now, says Barclay, what does it mean to say my experience of a shape is just like the real shape in reality? My experience is certainly not triangular. My experience doesn't occupy space at all. My experience has no size, but the real triangular entity has size. The real triangle might be moving at the rate of 30 miles an hour. My experience is certainly not moving at the rate of 30 miles an hour. It is therefore entirely gratuitous to talk about a similarity between a mental experience and a physical object. A sensation or an idea, he says, can resemble only another sensation or idea. What does it mean to say that mental contents resemble or copy reality? It doesn't mean anything legitimate. So much for the representative theory of perception. Now we go on, still within the same overall argument. Assume for a moment that there was some meaning to saying that our ideas resemble or represent reality. How can Locke say that any of his sensations or experiences resemble reality, even assuming it were meaningful to say so? To know whether his experiences resemble reality or not, he would have to do what? He'd have to have some access to reality and then compare his experience on the one hand with reality on the other and see whether they were similar or not. But according to Locke, this is impossible to do because he never comes into any contact with reality. Now suppose, for instance, I open one hand to you and show you a quarter and my other hand is closed behind my back and you have no access whatever to what is in my other hand, if anything. And now I say to you, does the thing that I have in my open hand, the quarter, resemble or not the thing in my other hand? Well, your obvious answer would be, I have to know what's in your other hand. But suppose I say you never can perceive what's in my other hand. Well, your obvious conclusion would have to be you haven't the faintest idea whether what I have in my hand does or doesn't resemble the other because you have no access to it. Indeed, if you never could come in contact with the content of my other hand, you'd have to say it was unknowable to you. And that is precisely, says Barclay, the position that Locke is in with regard to the material world. 
if we only perceive our own experiences, we have then got no way to go outside of our experiences and compare them to reality. And therefore, if the causal theory of perception is correct, the material world must be unknowable. But now, says Barclay, accept this much, which he does. If there were a material world, it would be unknowable, because we never perceive it, we only perceive our own experiences. Now, he simply adds another premise to this, which, which other premise is perfectly logical. He says, the idea of an unperceivable material world is a contradiction in terms. The idea of an unperceivable or unknowable world, is a, a material world, is a contradiction in terms. What do we mean by a material object? Well, if you go by common sense, you mean by a material object, something which can be seen, something which can be touched in appropriate circumstances, something which can be tasted, smelled, heard, etc. Now, suppose I hold up this hand for the benefit of the people on the tape, there's nothing apparently on it. And I tell you, take a look at this apple. And you say to me, what apple? I say, well, this is a special kind of apple. It happens to be unperceivable, unknowable. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. Well, you'd say to me, how do you distinguish that kind of apple from nothing, whatever? If it's a physical apple, it must be perceivable. A material thing is a thing capable of being perceived or experienced which is obviously true. Now we simply combine these two premises. If you're taking the argument down, it's a simple syllogism with two premises leading to a conclusion. Premise one, a material thing is a thing capable of being perceived. Premise two, the only things we're capable of perceiving are experiences in our own minds. That's the premise of Locke. All we perceive is experiences of our own minds. Well, what follows from those two premises? Just think about it. A material thing is a thing we can perceive. The only things we can perceive are experiences in our own minds. The conclusion must be a material thing is a collection of experiences in our own minds. Therefore, it's true that we can perceive material things directly, but that's because Material things are simply experiences in our own minds. In other words, says Barclay, I'm simply combining two premises which no one can contest. On the one hand, a premise of the common man on the street with his good common sense. The other, the premise that all philosophers grant. The common man says a material thing is a thing capable of being experienced. I agree. All the philosophers contribute the second premise. The things we experience are the ideas in our own mind. I put the two together. And my conclusion is, therefore, a material thing is a set of ideas in our own mind. Now, of course, we move in for the kill. <laughs> An idea, a sensation, an experience in the mind is in the same category as the toothache. It can only exist when it is being experienced. An unsensed sensation, an unthought idea, an unperceived perception, an unexperienced experience is a contradiction in terms. Unless the mind experienced its own experiences, those experiences wouldn't exist. The very being of an experience consists in its being perceived. But matter, as I have demonstrated, he claims, is simply a set of experiences. Final conclusion, matter only exists insofar as it is being experienced. Therefore, in the case of matter, esse est per kipi. To be is to be perceived. So much for the external world, QED. How do you like that one? <laughs> now I quote from Barclay. Quote, it is indeed an opinion strangely prevailing among men that houses, mountains, rivers, and in a word, all sensible objects have an existence natural or real 
distinct from their being perceived by the understanding. This is a strange opinion. But with how great an assurance soever this principle may be entertained, yet whoever shall find in his heart to call it in question may, if I mistake not, perceive it to involve a manifest contradiction. For what are the aforementioned objects but the things we perceive by sense? And what do we perceive besides our own ideas or sensations? And is it not plainly repugnant that any one of these or any combination of them should exist unperceived? Unquote. Notice Barclay says, he's a champion of the senses. He is an empiricist. He believes the senses are perfectly reliable. They give you reality. Only reality is the experiences in your own mind. In fact, says Barclay, I'm the one real assured champion of the validity of the senses. You can be sure your senses aren't deceiving you and that your experiences are correct because they are only what you experience them to be. As long as you believe in an external material world, he says, there's always the question, how do you know your experiences are giving you that world as it really is? But if all there is is your mind and its experiences, then you can be sure your experiences are correct because your experiences have no nature other than what you experience them to be. Your toothache is only however you feel it to be. And since matter is all in that category, you can rest assured with your experiences of matter because it's whatever you experience it as. Now you see that on the premises of uh, Locke, this argument is unanswerable. And you see the disasters implicit in the causal and representative theory of perception. The question, therefore, for anyone who wants to retain the physical world is how to answer the Cartesian Lockean argument. And remember, their argument is we must perceive reality by its effects on us. And that seems unanswerable. And those effects seem to be in some way a function of our particular sensory constitution. If we had a different constitution, it would produce different effects. Aren't we then inevitably pushed back into our own consciousness? Each of us experiencing his own private experiences cut off from access to reality. At which point Barclay comes along and says, if you're cut off, there is no such thing and simply wipes it out. And here we're back all the way to Protagoras' original argument against the senses, which has now blossomed in full. Now, I may say that there are many people who disagree with Barclay vigorously and haven't the faintest idea how to answer him. There was a school of materialists in France, for instance, who declared that Barclay's viewpoint was an insane delusion, but unfortunately irrefutable. <laughs> All right, let us look now at the second argument that I will give, the last this evening, of Barclay's, the argument from the primary-secondary quality distinction. Now, this no longer depends on the causal theory of perception, so let's not assume the causal theory of perception. Let's start afresh. Nevertheless, says Barclay, I will still show you that matter is a set of ideas in the mind. This time, his taking off point is the traditional standard distinction, which goes all the way back to Democritus, although the terminology is locks, between primary and secondary quality. Now, you remember that the philosophers traditionally distinguish between these two qualities on the basis of two main arguments, the conceivability argument and the variability argument. And the conceivability argument says, I can't conceive matter without primary qualities, but I can easily conceive it without secondary qualities. And therefore, that goes to show that one set of qualities is intrinsic in matter, the other is dispensable. And the variability argument is, certain qualities, the secondary ones, vary from perceiver to perceiver, and that proves they are subjective a function of the sensory constitution of the perceiver, whereas others, the primary, are invariant, constant, the same for all perceivers, 
and that goes to show they are contributed by the real physical object. Now Barclay simply says, I intend to wipe out both of these arguments and ruin the material world thereby. He doesn't use the word ruin, but that's the idea. Well, let's first consider the conceivability argument. Well, he says, maybe Locke can conceive of matter which has primary qualities and no secondary qualities. I, Bishop Barclay, cannot. Can you, he asks, ever imagine a shape, to take that example of a primary quality, can you ever imagine a shape without a color? Go ahead right now, try. Visualize a shape, for instance, a big triangle without a color. Well, of course, as soon as you obliterate the color in your mind, what happens to your image of the shape? Disappears. Now, of course, you might do it with some other secondary quality. If you were blind, you might imagine running your hands over this triangular shape and getting some sensation of warm, smooth surface. But if you obliterate that also, what is left of the shape? A shape that can't be seen, a shape that can't be touched, a shape devoid of color, texture, and every secondary quality. Well, says Barclay, I can't tell the difference between that and nothing at all. Shape is inseparable from some secondary quality, let us say color. And if the color exists only in the mind, then the shape that we see must exist only in the mind also. Or give another example, I'll give you another example of a primary quality is supposed to be motion. Now, suppose I say over to the left of me here is something moving. Go and visualize it. But strip it of all secondary qualities. Can you conceive it? Can you imagine it? Can you visualize it? Obviously, you cannot. If you strip it of all secondary qualities, it simply evaporates. Now, you can do this with all primary qualities. The general point, says Barclay, is you perceive the so-called primary qualities only by means of the secondary qualities. So if the secondary are unreal, subjective, and exist only in the mind, so must the primary be. In any event, they must be in the same boat metaphysically. If they're both one in the mind, both in the mind. If one in reality, both in reality. So much for the conceivability argument. Now, I interject here simply to call to your attention the fact that I have uh, deliberately been equivocating on one point. Barclay asks, can you conceive shape without color? And proceeds to answer the question, can you visualize or form an image of shape without color? Now, by the fact of switching the question from can you conceive to can you visualize, that, of course, will immediately suggest to you that Barclay equates an abstract concept with an image. And that, of course, should suggest to you right away that Barclay is a nominalist, which he is, an avid, full-fledged nominalist. And this particular part of his argument depends upon his nominalism. Nevertheless, that is not his whole argument, and the rest continues even without it. Let us pick up the rest of it. Suppose you say, all right, Barclay, or Bishop, you have shown to me that primary and secondary qualities are in the same boat, and that I can't say one half is in the mind and one half is in reality. Well, I'm going to then go completely in the other direction. I will say all of them are intrinsic in physical objects. None of them exist in the mind. Very well, says Barclay. Now I will prove to you that the very same argument that proves that secondary qualities are only mental and subjective applies equally to primary qualities, namely the variability argument. Remember the reasoning. Since facts are facts, they don't depend upon the perceiver. And therefore, if something varies from perceiver to perceiver, it must simply be mental. Well, says Barclay, I propose to show you an obvious fact. All primary qualities vary from perceiver to perceiver just exactly as the so-called secondary qualities do. 
they are just as dependent upon the conditions of our perception. And if such variability proves subjectivity, it proves that the primary qualities are just as subjective as the secondary ones, and thus that the whole distinction collapses. Now, for instance, consider the question of size, which is supposed to be a real orthodox kosher primary quality. Well, is size independent of the conditions of perception? Well, the standard example given by followers of Barclay here is to ask, what is the size of the sun? Is it the size that you see if you take an Apollo spaceship and head right straight for the sun? Obviously, you're going to get a much bigger experience. Then if you look at the size from the Earth, which makes it look about the size of a 50 cent piece, is the size you see the size with your ordinary eyes or the size under a magnifying glass? What if there was a race with magnification built into their eyes? They would see everything bigger than we do. So size obviously depends upon your structure of your organs and your distance from the object. It's variable. If variability proves subjectivity, size is subjective. And what about shape? Now here the standard thing for a professor of philosophy to do is to take a quarter or a penny and walk into the middle of a class and say, so you believe that this has a real shape? And the students, not yet having been completely corrupted, say yes. <laughs> then he proceeds to have each of them describe the shape. And of course, he is so located that they all perceive it from different perspectives. So some people say they see a perfect circle, and other people say no, they see an ellipse slanted in one direction. And other people say no, they see an ellipse slanted in another direction. And certain people see only a tiny little rim, etc. And they all come up with different descriptions of the shape. To which the professor says, well, you see, the shape varies with the perception. There is no such thing as the shape any more than there is the color or the temperature or the texture or the size. It all varies with the perceiver. If variability proves subjectivity, shape is just as subjective as uh, color and size. Now, of course, as far as motion is concerned, we can bring in Einstein and the so-called relativity of motion, which is supposed to prove that something can be moving or at rest, depending upon the frame of reference of the observer, so that even motion is a variable and therefore subjective. And even such a hardcore primary quality as number, whether there's one quarter or two, is supposed to be a function of our experience, and variable, for instance, press in your eyeball, and you will suddenly see this single quarter multiply into two. Go ahead, you can try it, but don't press too hard, or it'll, be, <laughs> it'll become zero, because you'll go blind. <laughs> now, of course, it's not normal for people to press their eyeballs in, but we don't go by majority rule in philosophy. Obviously, the kind of eyes we have, therefore, I'm speaking now for the followers of Barclay, determine <laughs> what quantity we observe. And therefore, number, like shape, like size, like motion, are all variable. And therefore, they are all in the category of the so-called secondary qualities, the whole distinction breaks down. All qualities are subjective, and in all cases, therefore, essay est per kipi. Now you see the problem that we are in. On the one hand, you will say, we have to make a distinction between primary and secondary qualities, because after all, our senses contribute something to our experience. So doesn't it seem sensible on the face of it to say there's those qualities which derive from the kind of senses we have and those qualities which derive from the object? Therefore, two kinds of quality. And that was exactly the reasoning by which the primary secondary quality distinction was arrived at. But on the other hand, as soon as you make the distinction between two kinds of quality, Whatever test you use to justify that distinction, Barclay and his followers come along, 
and prove that whatever argument shows that the so-called secondary or subjective applies just as well to the primary and you end up with no reality at all. Now, what is the answer to this particular problem? That's part of the same issue of the senses on which we will spend a good amount of time next week. The conclusion for Berkeley, at any event, is therefore the whole physical world with everything in it, all the furniture of the earth, is nothing but a series of experiences in the mind and would not exist if there were no beings perceiving it. Now there are people who try to refute this by uh, direct experience. I simply point out to you that that is a hopeless proposition to attempt to do. You cannot, by direct experience, refute Barclay, because he will demand that you prove by experience that something exists when you are not experiencing it. And of course, you can't do that. Whenever you experience it, you're experiencing it. It's like the story, for instance, of the drunk who was told after he reached a sufficient stage of intoxication that the street light went out whenever he closed his eyes and came back on whenever he opened his eyes. And of course, he closed his eyes and opened them as rapidly as he could and looked up and he said, oh, it isn't true, the light is on. And the man told him, of course it's on, your eyes are open. You have to, uh, you, it only goes out when your eyes are closed. Now, obviously, you cannot refute that by experience because you would have to see it when you're not seeing it. And therefore, the question is, how do you refute Barclay? Since, uh, according to many people, the only way to refute him would be to perceive something existing when you're not perceiving it. And you can't do that. Well, of course, the way to refute him is to refute the premises which led him to this conclusion. By the way, a camera will not refute him. There are people who say the way to answer Barclay is to set up a camera in a vacant room and come back and then expose the film and then show the picture and that'll show the room was still there when nobody was experiencing it. But of course, Barclay would come back in such a case and say, that doesn't prove anything. As soon as you left the room, the camera disappeared. The whole room disappeared. Nothing existed when you didn't perceive it. And as soon as you came back, the camera came back in, and the film came back in with its particular alteration. If you want to know why it was altered, I'll tell you shortly. <laughs> in other words, he has to be answered on philosophic grounds. Now, that's the, the thrust of Barclay's philosophy. We can cover a few last points before we leave him. Some philosophers ask, well, isn't matter more than simply the sum of the qualities. What about the substratum that has those qualities? You recall Locke's substratum, the thing underneath the qualities which sticks them all together, the thing which has the qualities, which Locke described as something I know not what. Well, of course, Berkeley has no difficulty whatever disposing of the substratum. And in this respect, he is perfectly correct. Uh, the idea of a substratum is the idea of something without any identity and is a completely invalid idea. Uh, Locke was contradicting his own philosophy completely and endorsing it, and Berkeley is quite right to throw it out. Now, I might mention that Berkeley, being a bishop, was not 100% consistent with regard to the issue of the substratum. He wanted to keep the spiritual substance, the soul, the self, uh, because religion required that. And so he said that in the case of the soul, there were not only the mental processes we engaged in, but also the substratum which bound and united them together. Now, how could he possibly keep the substratum in the mental realm, having denounced it in the physical? Well, he said, it's true that we don't have any clear idea of the substratum, but we have a notion of it. Uh, obviously an extraordinarily lame viewpoint, <laughs> and Hume had no difficulty getting rid of it in the spiritual world either. It's a hopeless to try and keep it in either realm. Now, you may ask this question, 
if Barclay truly believes that SAS pair keeping, does that mean that stars, for instance, don't exist when you're not perceiving them? Take the people in the very back row, this gentleman in the very back row. Now, don't touch the back of your head. So no one is presumably perceiving it. Can we conclude, therefore, that it does not exist? Or what about your apartment if there's no one there now? Or the famous example was, what about the tree out in the park, the tree in the quad? The quadrangle, does it not exist if no one is perceiving it? To which Barclay's answer is, I don't mind you using the terminology that it exists when you don't perceive it, so long as you understand that its existence depends upon somebody's perception. To exist is to be perceived. Esse est per keeping. So to say a thing exists when you are not perceiving it is either to say, if you looked, you'd see it. In other words, a statement about a material object is really simply a prediction about some mind's future experiences. Or else, to say a thing exists when you're not perceiving it is to say that some other mind or spirit is perceiving it. But you don't have to worry, says Barclay, because even if no human mind is perceiving your apartment or the back of your head or the tree in the quad, there is always some mind perceiving everything and thereby keeping everything in existence. <laughs> and guess who that is? <laughs> God. Now, there is a famous limerick, if I can remember it, which has two stanzas which expresses Barclay's philosophy on this point. The first stanza explains the problem, and the second, the solution. It goes like this. There was a young man who said, God must find it exceedingly odd that this tree which I see still continues to be when there's no one about in the quad? And the answer is, dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad. And that's why this tree still continues to be, since perceived by, yours faithfully, God. <laughs> Now, that's Barclay's viewpoint. Now, his followers, of course, in later decades abandoned God, and we were left with the viewpoint that existence goes out of existence when it is not perceived. And in this sense, S.A.S. per Kipi, although they may not know it, is the perfect metaphysics for any evader, because their premise is if you don't look at it, it's not there. And here is a full-fledged metaphysical demonstration, allegedly, of this viewpoint. Now, a last point on Barclay. Dr. Samuel Johnson is famous for having given, allegedly, a refutation of Barclay. And his refutation consisted of taking a stone and kicking it, by which he wanted to express his exasperation at what he took to be Barclay's denial of the reality of the physical world. He said, in effect, aren't you denying reality to our experiences? When I kick this stone, it's a real solid stone. It's not a mental image or a dream or a hallucination or an experience. It's reality. How can you have such a concept as reality if everything is mental? Now, if you deal with followers of Barclay, and there's quite a number of them today. I believe Einstein at one point claimed to be a follower of Barclay. You should know that they are vehement in saying that they're all in favor of reality. But, they say, reality is not an issue of something existing external to the mind or independent of the mind. Reality is an issue of the kind of experience that takes place in the mind. There are two kinds of experiences, and we can separate them on many counts. For instance, some experiences are involuntary. We can't get rid of them by an act of will, whereas others can. We can. And so, for instance, 
obvious fantasies and mental images you can banish by an act of will, and by that very fact they are disqualified from being part of reality. Or, another count, some experiences are vivid, sharp, clear. Others are faint, pale, indistinct, blurred, vague. And of course, in this case, we normally take the faint, blurred ones and say, oh, that isn't reality, that's a dream. Uh, whereas the sharp, clear ones, we say, that's reality. And most important, the third criterion of reality, some experiences are well-behaved. They are connected in a regular manner with previous and subsequent experiences. They are orderly. They obey what we call scientific laws. On the other hand, other experiences are wild and bizarre. They do not fit nicely into the scheme of the rest of our experiences. So, for instance, what is the difference for Barclay between a pink rat that you see after you drink a lot and a pink rat which is an actual rat, only somebody poured pink paint on him? What's the difference? Well, a normal non-follower of Barclay says that the hallucinatory rat exists in the mind and the real rat exists outside of the mind. Barclay says nonsense. Both rats exist in the mind. But the difference is, the hallucinatory rat is not well behaved. If you take the real rat and you take the experience of a knife, and with that experience you cut into the experience of the rat, you will find another experience, blood. Whereas if you take the experience of the hallucinatory rat and try and cut into it with the experience of a knife, you won't get any experience of blood. It doesn't bleed. And therefore, it is a badly behaved rat. <laughs> and consequently, we regard it as a hallucination, not as real. And therefore, the only difference between reality on the one hand and unreality on the other, or fantasy, is that reality is that set of involuntary, vivid, lawful mental experiences. Whereas unreality is either voluntary, blurred, or at minimum, wild. <coughs> and therefore, he says to Dr. Johnson, I don't deny that you kicked the stone, but the point is, all you had was an experience of a stone, followed by an experience of a toe, followed by an experience of a pain, all following one another in a lawful way, and therefore the whole thing took place in the mind. Now, if you say, but mustn't there be a cause of our experiences? Maybe we make up the voluntary, pale ones, but what about the lawful, vivid, involuntary ones? We don't make them up since they're involuntary. We don't impose law on them, but they follow laws. If it's not an external physical world that causes our experiences, where do they come from? Well, says Barclay, you're right, they must have a cause. They must be produced in us by something external to us. And given the variety and order and lawfulness of these experiences, we can only infer that they must be caused in us by a being that is, quote, wise, powerful, and good beyond comprehension. In other words, by God. God feeds us our experiences directly and imposes law and order upon them. And reality, therefore, is a series of finite minds contemplating their own experiences fed to them all by the infinite mind, God. You see, therefore, a reality very similar to Leibniz's view. So much for Barclay's contribution to philosophy. The end of the material world. Barclay, however, is not as extreme as you can get. He's still a bishop. He believed in God. He believed in the soul. He believed in cause and effect, even if of a divine sort. He has taken Locke's premises partway to their ultimate conclusion, but not the full way. That honor goes to David Hume.
And according to Barclay, how can God exist independent of his being perceived? Well, I left out one point for Barclay. There's two ways to exist. If it's a soul or a mind, its existence doesn't consist of its being perceived, but of its actually being capable of perceiving. So in its case, SAS per keepere, to be is to perceive. And since God perceives, since he has experiences and ideas and so on, he exists in the way that a mind or soul exists, as a perceiving entity. On Barclay's premises, is it enough for an object to be perceived by any mind in order to, for it to exist, or must it be by your mind? No, it can be by any mind, he says, and since God is always perceiving, everything always exists as is sustained by God. His followers, of course, got rid of God, and in the process they were left each contemplating only his own experiences, which had no source. That didn't bother them because they followed Hume, so they dispensed with cause and effect. But then the question was, how did they know that any other human beings existed, even any other human minds? Because their only contact with other human minds was by the experience of their bodies, and their bodies were only experiences in their own mind. And so they ended up with the idea that all that exists is their own mind and its content, and that everybody else was simply a figment of their imagination. And that is the viewpoint known as solipsism, I myself aloneism which is the ultimate upshot of Barclay's idealism. But Barclay himself, of course, a bishop, would not take this viewpoint.